Hey guys, thank you so much for joining me on their fight story with Igdalia. We have Leah Letson, tech sergeant and a professional MMA fighter who's currently six and two. Leah, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. What inspired you to become a martial artist? I actually became a martial artist when I was only five years old. So I saw a commercial on TV when I was like four and it was for karate classes. And so I didn't quit begging my mom for a whole year <laughs> until she went and signed me up for karate lessons. And so I did karate from the time I was five years old until I was about 11. And then I switched over to Taekwondo and did that until I was uh, 17. And then when I went to college, um, I was looking for a different martial art to get into. And uh, I found cardio kickboxing and I loved it and I got in good shape. So when I enlisted in the Air Force, um, I knew I was going to be going to basic training and I needed to be in good shape. So I took um, another cardio kickboxing class in order to get in shape for basic training. And then it turns out the instructors for that um, own their own MMA gym. So they invited me to come try jujitsu. I fell in love with that. Um, so shortly after I got back from basic training in tech school, I uh, started training with the fight team. And then after about a month and a half on less than 24 hour notice, I got a call from my coach saying, hey, you're going to fight tomorrow. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was like, what? And then uh, I did, and it was the best thing that ever happened because that's when I discovered that that's what I wanted to do with my life. Wow. So that wasn't even part of your, like, your future, like your goal when you were growing no. up. No, that wasn't. I was actually going to school. Um, I graduated with a bachelor's in psychology and criminal justice because I was going to go into federal law enforcement originally. So um, my life took a complete 180, and then that's when I pursued my uh, athletic career. So, yeah. <laughs> How did you balance your military life with the training and being a fighter? Um, at times it was really difficult. Uh, a lot of time management skills, I'd mm -hmm. say. Um, cause I was also a full-time college student throughout most of my, the beginning of my career at least. And, uh, so I was full-time student, uh, part-time military and then full-time fighter as well. So I'd bring my homework to the gym and study <laughs> between classes. Um, I'd study for my military exams, uh, <laughs> also between classes. And then, um, I had to miss out on a lot of, uh, training and obviously fights when I was deployed. Um, and that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was come back from a deployment because, I stayed in shape while I was over there, but staying in shape and staying in fight shape are two different things. Mm -hmm. um, I was lucky in that I was able to teach jujitsu overseas. So I was um, in the desert teaching my fellow <laughs> Air Force people how to do jujitsu. And so I got lucky that um, I was in charge of the jujitsu club over there. So I did get to train a little bit, but, you know, still, it's not the same as uh, sparring every day or like with your training partners back home and with coaches and all that. But um, and I did have a, an awesome friend uh, named Ben, who is Australian, and he did Muay Thai. So I got to train with him overseas, too. So that was cool. Um, so I kind of had to just sacrifice a little bit um, of my time for both the military and for MMA. So I was just on the weekends, I'd get up extra early to do workouts before my drill day. And then afterwards, I'd drive 45 minutes to the nearest gym that was closest to my base. And it was just... It's a lot of sacrifice. <laughs> wow. How did you find that, um, the strength to just stay focused um, in doing that and not allowing the stress of, of all the stuff that you were trying to manage at the same exact time? I guess for me, uh, I knew the sacrifices were going to mean something one day and it was going to pay off. And uh, when I set my mind to something, I'm going to do it. And from that first fight, I knew I was going to be in the UFC one day. I just didn't know when. Mm -hmm. So because that was my goal and that was my number one priority in life, I just made it my number one priority in life. Like I sacrificed what I needed to. I, I did as much hard work as I needed to. Um, dedication and and uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> sacrifice, I'd have to say, because <laughs> it's a whole lifestyle fighting. It's not just something mm -hmm. that you do on the side. It's like your whole diet and your whole life, it rolls around training and fighting and it's like a 24 seven thing. So, um, yeah. I guess I wanted it bad enough and, uh, I knew it was going to make it happen. 
Yeah, it, it is a complete lifestyle. And, you know, the military is always, it's also a lifestyle that it's just like, they kind of, depending what you're doing, go, go together, but they won't ever, <laughs> like, really, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you took, yeah. It's definitely different. It's definitely different. Yeah. But, um, at least the discipline <laughs> and the sacrifice is shared in both career fields. Mm -hmm. So both MMA and military demand that of you. So um, kind of had that instilled in me, I guess. Yeah. Well, not everybody's like that. Not everybody's <laughs> built like you. <laughs> what fight stands out the most in your career? Um, I've. I'd have to say my Invicta fight, um, when I landed that head kick knockout, um, that was probably the highlight of my career <laughs> and that was the coolest feeling ever. Um, cause she hit me with an overhand and I remember feeling it and I'm like, mm, that's probably going to hurt tomorrow. I don't want to have to deal with that again. So then I just made sure, um, I set up my head kick and then it just landed beautifully and it didn't even feel like I hit her that hard and then she just fell and that was that was really cool <laughs> that's all she wrote <laughs> yeah and then that was also my send off into deployment because I knew I was going to get deployed after that okay so that was like the best way to like pause my career I yes. guess I guess you could say so yeah <laughs> that is awesome that's definitely a way as a female fighter did you encounter any difficulties in the sport Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. I know a lot of people say that um, sexism is the thing of the past, but it's mm -hmm. it's really not, especially in the MMA sport. Um, the current gym I go to has, is really great, and I don't deal with any of that stuff there, which is awesome. We have a lot of females at Wanderlei Jiu-Jitsu. Um, they're a really supportive environment. At my first gym, though, it was definitely obvious that I had to work – probably 10 times as hard just to get about half of the respect. Like I remember being the only female in the gym most of the time. And I remember guys coming in. And at first, when I first started training with the fight team, they would just look at me like, what is she doing here? And then they would roll their eyes when they had to go with me. And then I would frustrate them because I was actually, you know, good yeah. at it. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was probably my favorite part um, of the sport of when someone new would come in, some gym bro would come in and think he's all big and bad because he can bench press a lot. And then he would do jujitsu and I would just submit him left and right. And he would get so frustrated. And that was with multiple different guys. And that was probably mm -hmm. my favorite thing to do. And after a while, um, my coach would actually laugh and be like, Leah, go roll with that person because <laughs> they need an ego check. So, <laughs> so yes, uh, I definitely had to work a lot harder just to get even half the respect of yeah. my male counterparts. Now, um, I was at a show once and um, I remember um, there was a male coach and the person he was cornering was a female. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Like, what have you experienced? Like, is there difficulty? Like when you, when you have a male coach and you know, they give you one room, it's, do they assume you guys are together? And you know, uh, every time I've been on a show, I've never had to share a room with a coach with female fighters. They usually give you two rooms. Okay. So that's always been the case for me. I've never had to share a room, but it wouldn't even, it wouldn't have been a big deal if I did have to share a room. I have mm -hmm. shared a room with a coach before just for like training trips on um, my wrestling coach, Ben, and I have shared a room before, but it's, I mean, his wife knows about it. My husband mm -hmm. knew about it. It wasn't like, <laughs> it wasn't because he, he was like a big brother to me. So it's mm -hmm. weird to think about it in any other way, you know, and it's just, we're there for business, you know? So I don't, I don't know. It's only weird if you make it weird, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I know that that particular situation, um, the coach wasn't comfortable. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So Which, then I was like, huh, I wonder. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it, I guess, but I guess as a tomboy and someone that grew up with mostly male friends to me, and like even being in the military, I'm just surrounded by guys all the time. So to me, I don't think twice about it, but I guess mm -hmm. I could see it would be different for other people mm -hmm. and to each their own, I guess. Yeah, definitely. What was the worst injury you received in the sport and how did you overcome it? Okay, so <laughs> um, as far as injuries go, 
I guess um, I have to say my ACL. I tore my ACL, MCL, and my meniscus all in one Ooh. move um, during a MMA practice. I was doing a double leg takedown, and I went to turn, and my foot stayed planted while the rest of me turned, and it tore everything in my right knee. And so I had surgery about a month after that, um, and... It took about five and a half months before I was back to 100% training again. But um, I did a lot of rehab and prehab before surgery even. So the doctor said I made a miraculous recovery and like I haven't had any problems since. However, um, I'd say <laughs> the biggest setback I've ever had in fighting is not really an injury per se. It was health issues. Okay. And, and that came from... Um, severe overtraining and severe mm. under eating um, for years. That was actually an issue. I didn't know any better. I guess for me, it was always like, I thought I listened to my coaches and they always were like, work harder um, and eat less. If you want to cut weight after a while, mm. as a female, your body kind of starts to reject that. And uh, you start to like, hold on to more and more weight between fights. And eventually um, I almost was to the point of um, organ failure and I have hypothyroidism wow. now and hormone issues. I had, um, everything's been kind of balanced out. I've been working with a functional medicine doctor um, and he's the one who's actually like saved my life mm -hmm. and allowed me to fight again. Uh, but I had to take three years to recover from that because for about seven or eight years I was, severely overtrained and under eating and just to give you a idea of how much I was overtraining uh, I was training like six to eight hours every single day and hard like as hard as I could mm -hmm. and I was eating most days between 600 and a thousand calories That's it. wow um, so <laughs> needless to say, I uh, ended up changing gyms and, and coaches because <laughs> that was not the way to do it. And I just kept getting told like, I, oh, you must be cheating on your diet. You must be cheating on your diet. Why aren't you losing weight? I'm like, I wish I was cheating on my mm -hmm. diet because then I would feel so much better. Yeah. Like, I felt horrible. And I, I can't even explain to you, um, how horrible I felt every single day. I just felt sick and tired and mm -hmm. like, I, I just, um. I felt like I was in a daze. I couldn't even think clearly. Kind of like if you take a bunch of doses of NyQuil mm -hmm. and try to function, that's how I felt all the time. And I don't wish that upon anyone. So if there's any fighters out there watching this, don't overtrain and don't undereat. No matter what your coaches say, what you've been told, you have to fuel your body for training. And I hope that no one makes the same mistake I did. Wow. Did you ever have, I mean any difficulties and I know you, you said like with the weight and stuff like that, but like right before um, weighing in, like for the weight cut, did you ever put yourself in a position where, you know, you had to go to the emergency room or anything like that? Um, I never ended up going to the emergency room. There was one time I thought I should go to the emergency room, but my coach was like, Oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Just rehydrate. Um, and that was, um, the second time I tried to fight at 135 and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't cut any more weight. I actually ended up missing weight by a couple pounds and I felt horrible. Like I literally felt pain on like my organs. Like I felt like horrible and um, I, I, ended, I ended up winning the fight, um, but it wasn't good. Like mm -hmm. now knowing more about weight cutting and know, knowing my body a lot better it was a really bad idea. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's, that's why, you know, and I always talk to fighters and, and when I have interviews that it's always important to know who is in your corner and who your management team is and all that, because they need to be the ones, you know, looking out for you. And, but if you see that it doesn't work, you have to speak up. And if you have to move to another place then you have to go because it's your life that yeah. it's on the line and it's your career as well. Yeah. And I think I struggled with that too, because I, I have, um, I'm extremely loyal and I mm -hmm. felt like I was going to be disloyal, but I, I eventually got to the point where 
it was it was my life like on the line like literally my life was on the line and I had to do something for my health and for my physical and mental health honestly and it was it was just a bad situation so I left and I've been much happier ever since yeah I've seen your pictures with your your wedding pictures and everything oh, you look you. so beautiful <laughs> thank you <laughs> you're welcome now you announced that you would be retiring yes I decided I was going to be retiring from MMA just because um, there's been a lot of changes, uh, a lot of things going on with my family that I need to focus on. Um, I don't want to talk about those family issues mm -hmm. right now, but there's things that are going on that I need to focus on, mm -hmm. take higher priority over fighting. And to be completely honest, um, I just kind of got burned out on the sport in general. Um, I did so much for a decade and um, I'm really happy and grateful for my career and how far I got, but I don't love it anymore. And um, if you don't love it and your head's not in it, it's a dangerous game to be in. So once I, once I decided like, okay, maybe I should be retired and the thought of retiring and being done with fighting felt like a weight was lifted off my shoulders mm -hmm. almost. And that's how I knew I was making the right decision. Um, I think, uh, I'll always be a martial artist for sure. And I'll always probably be training um, for fun. But for right now, I'm um, taking a little break from training. I just need a little mental break from it. And I just, I don't love the sport anymore. Not enough to make it my career. So my values changed. And uh, so I decided to move on to something else. Yeah. Well, I wish you the best in whatever your path is taking. Thank you. And it's also important, you know, for people that are listening that, Like you said, you don't want to discuss it. You don't have to discuss it. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. nobody's business. Like just by you saying, you know, just dealing, you know, changing my priorities, focusing on my family, that should be enough. Like, yep. and we need to live in a, in a world where we don't have to keep like justifying our decisions. Right. You right. know what it is. Your husband knows what it is. Your family, that's all that matters. We can't be too worried about what everybody else is going to say, what they're going to think. Oh, do I tell them? Do I not tell them? The answer is no, because it's your <laughs> life. And that's it. That's really all that matters. You know, you're happy and that's it. Whatever makes you happy is what you should do. You know? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. What will you do now with that small piece that you're going to have available? Because <laughs> it wasn't so, much for you. Temporarily. So for the past, like, huh, almost six months now, actually, yeah, six months, I've been temporarily full-time on my Air National Guard base. Um, nice. My orders are going to be ending soon, though. So I am – I've been playing around with a bunch of different ideas mm -hmm. because I have a lot of interests and a lot of different talents and skills in different career fields. But I think my true passion is teaching. So mm -hmm. I am trying to get a job as a teacher, get my emergency teaching license, and then go back to school and become – a fully licensed teacher. Um, I love math. I love science. I'm a huge nerd. <laughs> like, so uh, I think being a teacher is definitely my calling. I like the idea of um, also continuing to be a mentor and role model mm -hmm. to kids. Like that's something I'm super passionate about. And the hardest part of walking away from the sport for mm -hmm. me is I'm afraid of losing that platform. I get to give motivational speeches and go on podcasts and talk to people and motivate people. And so I want to be able to continue doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I can make a difference in the next generation by becoming a teacher. So that's what that's what my goal is. That is awesome. So wait, you like math? I do. So is um, Ode going to help you get into the teaching? <laughs> you know, I could call him up and ask him. I actually, I haven't thought about that. But yeah, I will. I'll give him a, a shout out. And I, after this, talk to him about it. I love him. He's awesome. I know. I love Ode. He's one of my best friends. <laughs> yeah, he's he's amazing. He's um he always keeps me um keeps me on my toes with yeah. with his comments, you know, and and his humor yeah. and all that stuff. But is there anything else that you would love to share with us before we conclude with this interview? Uh, feel free to continue following me on social media. I'm still going to be posting um all of my adventures and journeys with the Air Force and with teaching and all that. And if you guys know of anyone who wants um, someone to come in and speak to kids or groups of Girl Scout troops or whatever it is, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, just because you're retiring does not mean that 
the Leah that we know stops existing. Exactly. You know, it doesn't. This is just a new chapter in your life. Yeah. And the people who follow you will be able to continue to see what your journey holds and the difference that you're going to keep making in other people's lives. Yes. You know, so you've helped the young fighters, yep. you know, going into this path and you're teaching them to be aware of how they are taking themselves, taking care of themselves through yes. this journey. Yeah. And then you're also teaching them that the moment you don't feel that passion and that love anymore, then it's okay to walk away from it. There Sorry. is nothing wrong with it. Yep. And then just find the joy. Cause look at you are like, you're glowing. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's like, obviously it's, it's, it's a good, it's a good step that you're taking in the right direction for your life. Yep. Because if it wasn't, you would not have that expression on your face. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Thank you.